a privilege and honor to be in front of you today. Thank you, Sheriff Mack, for the invitation to come. I'm going to have our sheriff, uh, Sheriff Terry Makita, who's a colleague of mine, come up with me here today because he's going to um, speak t with me in just a little while. I'm a public servant who wants to support our sheriff in fulfilling the constitutional rights of the citizens of El Paso County. But historians agree that Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Germany were not taken over by forceful means. Everything that happened in those countries, and even during the war, were imposed through law. Those countries were taken over by the pen. They were taken over through written legislation that was passed to protect the people against terrorism and in the name of national security. Similar legislation was adopted, I think, in our NDAA, our National Defense Authorization Act. The German people lost their rights and they lost their lives, and historians have called it Bruning's Folly. These governments weren't taken over by an uprising or even a violent revolt. They were taken over by a very well-organized political campaign to gain a majority within their legislative bodies. If our Constitution is not enacted and upheld, any group that is well-organized could potentially do the same in the United States of America. I would also like to note for emphasis that Germany was a democratic republic just like the United States, with similar laws and structures prior to 1933 until their constitution was undermined through legal legislative changes. And I think that it is incumbent upon us as county commissioners and as sheriffs to ensure that we act together, that we act collaboratively to protect the citizens that we were sworn to protect and took the oath of office to protect. So would you welcome Sheriff Terry Makita. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Sheriff Mack, for having me here. It wasn't my office that came forward with this resolution. It was Commissioner Littleton who on her own had this brought to her attention and very aggressively had this resolution drafted. Obviously it had to go through a series of attorneys. We have a fairly large county, which means we have extra attorneys, which means more people have to put their thumbprint on it. But within a matter of seven to eight days, had this posted through the legal requirements and before the Board of County Commissioners to be voted on unanimously. I think it was real easy for me to support this resolution, it was a no-brainer. It's doing what I believed I took this job to do. It's what I expect every one of my employees to do, whether sworn or civilian. And we've seen it too often now where federal agencies and state agencies are chipping away at the constitutional rights of our citizens by using bribe money. They're calling it grants. They're saying, if you don't do this, you're not gonna get this funding. And it's time we say, I don't need your funding. Right. And I, I, tell, I tell all my friends that are chiefs of police that uh, if, if you really want to serve citizens, run for sheriff. Because that's where you can hear them, you can listen to them, and you don't have to worry about a non-law enforcement elected bureaucrat trying to set policy with, with, with no knowledge or understanding of individual constitutional rights. And I think that's what we're here for, and I think that's what the Office of Sheriff stands for. And I find it no surprise that there are people around the country trying to do away with the Office of Sheriff. And that's where we truly need to stand strong. So thank you. Believe me, I, I, there's nothing I could do for the state other than what I'm doing here today. But there was something that I could do for the county because I took an oath of office to protect the citizens of my county, utilizing every possible means within the law and abiding by the Constitution to enforce those laws that I could. And if I did not do that, then my oath, when my hand went on the Holy Bible, my right hand went up to take that oath of office, was no good. You walk into this room at your own risk because it leads to the future. Not a future that will be, but one that might be. 
This is not a new world. It is simply an extension of what began in the old one. It has patterned itself after every dictator who has ever planted the ripping imprint of a boot on the pages of history since the beginning of time. It has refinements, technological advances, and a more sophisticated approach to the destruction of human freedom. But like every one of the super states that preceded it, it has one iron rule. Logic is an enemy and truth is a menace. Any state, any entity, any ideology that fails to recognize the worth, the dignity, the rights of man, that state is obsolete. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. I'm very pleased for the men and women in uniform that Congress has come together in a bipartisan fashion to pass the defense authorization bill. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Paul, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to introduce a very simple piece of legislation to repeal the infamous Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act. Section 1021 essentially codifies into law the very dubious claim of presidential authority under 10, over 2001 authorization for the use of military force to indefinitely detain American citizens without access to legal representation or due process of law. Section 1021 provides for the possibility of the U.S. military acting as a kind of police force on U.S. soil, apprehending terror suspects, including Americans, and whisking them off to an undisclosed location indefinitely. No right to attorney, no right to trial, no day in court. Some have argued that nothing in Section 1021 explicitly mandates holding Americans without trial, but it employs vague language radically expanding the detention authority to include anyone who has substantially supported certain terrorist groups or associated forces. No one has defined what those ter terms mean. What is an associated force? Sadly, too many of my colleagues are too willing to undermine our Constitution to support such outrageous legislation. One senator even said about American citizens being picked up under section, under this section of the NDAA, quote, when they say, I want a lawyer, you tell them, shut up. You don't get a lawyer, close quote. And when they say, I want my lawyer, you tell them, shut up. Your time is expired. Get a lawyer. You're an enemy combatant. Is this acceptable in someone who has taken an oath to uphold the Constitution? You have the option to make sure that you can put intelligence gathering as the top priority. So this, as you've identified and talked about, is a very reasonable compromise. And as you know, uh, my colleague from South Carolina, I would have actually liked to seen this go further. But this is very important that we bring this forward. And your citizenship is not a sort of a get out of jail free card. That the law of the land is an American citizen can be held as an enemy combatant. That went to the Fourth Circuit, and that, as I speak, is the law of the land. 1031, the statement of authority to detain, does apply to American citizens, and it designates the world as the battlefield, including the homeland. The statement of authority to detain does apply to American citizens, and it designates the world as the battlefield, including the homeland.
Yes, our president has a hit list of American citizens like you targeted for assassination. And there are indications that the list of Americans targeted for assassination is growing. Well, we all know that their definition of terrorism in every government, every dictatorial regime, inevitably starts going to, to the area of people who criticize what the government's doing, uh, arguing against it, arguing against the immorality. Ultimately, they start seeing those people as the enemy, people that need to be taken out. Right. The CIA has the authority to execute without charge, without trial, without jury, without judge, without appeal, American citizens that it considers dangerous simply because they're not located in the United States. Where do they claim to get this power from? The president's battlefield powers extend everywhere, even to places where there is actually no combat whatsoever. It's not just overseas, because notice that they've always claimed that the U.S. is part of this battlefield. That means implicitly that they're saying the CIA can now assassinate any American, not only overseas, but here, as long as they label him a suspected terrorist. Well, During the eight years of the Bush administration, the battle was over torture. Whether they had the power to torture people that they labeled as terrorists with no trial, now Obama's taking it one step further and saying, well, we don't need to deal with torturing people anymore, we just kill them. And well, as you point out, it extends to Americans now. You look at what Democrats, including Barack Obama, objected to. It was merely things like eavesdropping on Americans and detaining them without due process and without charges. And now Democrats have completely abandoned those objections now that there's a Democrat in the White House. And apparently not just detaining and eavesdropping Americans, but targeting them for murder by undermining the linchpin for, for protecting basic human liberty. President Obama is proclaiming that the executive branch of the government of the United States of America has the explicit right and authority to murder American citizens. The government found the back door around those constitutional restrictions and saying, well, as long as we're at war, we can convert this crime, this criminal offense, terrorism, into an act of war at our option, and now we can do whatever we want. We're not constrained by the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. And I understand that this is a different type of battlefield that we're on, the 21st century battlefield. We're all on this battlefield. I find that we have to understand that we are at a war. We are not in a police action. We cannot look to guarantee to those who would seek to harm us the constitutional rights that are granted to Americans. If we extend that to them, then we are starting to say that this war on terror, this crim now is a criminal action. I have two words for you. Predator drones. <laughs> you will never see it coming. You think I'm joking? I sit on the Armed Services Committee, and I was also a conferee on the conference report. And I can tell you that on page 657 of the National Defense Authorization Act, it says that the military has no right to detain American citizens nor legal aliens. And that's there in chapter and verse. Now the military does have a requirement to detain al-Qaeda, Taliban, and associated forces, as well as those who substantially support those individuals. So the United States of America is not moving toward a police state. Now, understand this. The National Defense Authorization Act is the authorization document for the military as far as their funding, as far as their guidance uh, coming from the, the Congress and coming from the, uh, the White House for, for approval. So this has nothing to do with law enforcement agencies such as the FBI or others. So I think that there's a little bit of a paranoia out there with, uh, with citizens. It uh, allows detention in the law of war. We're no longer are we in the box of having to read Miranda rights to terrorists who come to America to kill us. We're giving authority to the American uh, intelligence community, law enforcement community, and military to detain someone who gets to America and attacks us here at home to gather intelligence. This idea of requiring Miranda rights and providing a lawyer to a terrorist who makes it here to America to kill us all, uh, I think, undercuts our ability to be safe. Uh, if you can detain somebody overseas wanting to attack 
attack America and not provide them a lawyer or Miranda rights, you should be able to do it here because this is the battlefield. So if someone goes to Pakistan as an American citizen, gets radicalized in Madras and comes back here and starts attacking Americans, I want to make sure they're held for intelligence gathering purposes and they're not read the Miranda rights, but they're held by the military, the CIA, and the FBI to find out there's another attack coming. fight to regain our freedom or everything is lost. Everything! Everything is fine. 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 And Ranking Member Smith is recognized to uh, explain and offer his amendment. And this does deal with the indefinite detention issue. But in 2001, Congress passed the AUMF, and courts have subsequently interpreted it to allow for the indefinite detention and for the military custody of people all over the world by the president if they are considered to be a covered person under the AUMF. In other words, if they are found to have committed certain acts in support of terrorism, um, they can be held indefinitely uh, by our country or uh, put in military custody and then put up for military tribunal. That existed prior to last year's NDAA. We also heard last year at many points that somehow last year's NDAA suspended habeas corpus. It did not. It never did. Because habeas corpus does apply to everybody. Now, that was the whole purpose of setting up Guantanamo Bay in the first place, because it was considered to be outside of U.S. control and therefore not subject to habeas corpus requirements. The Supreme Court came along, I think it was in the Hamdi decision, though occasionally I get them mixed up, and said, no, you know, Guantanamo Bay is effectively under U.S. control. You pick them up, send them there, they get habeas. That's settled law. What my bill does is actually goes at the substantive problem that was created in 2001. And that is that the indefinite detention power that's given to the present, president is an enormous amount of power. He basically, if he declares someone to be an enemy combatant, can take and hold that person indefinitely, and all that person gets in terms of process is the habeas corpus. It is an enormous amount of power, and I do think that the people that were raising concerns about the NDAA last year were right to raise concerns about this issue. It is very, very rare in this country to give that amount of power to the president, to take away any person's fundamental freedom and lock them up without the normal due process of law, without all of the civil liberties protected in our Constitution. To take that away is an enormous step. So we have to ask ourselves the question, is it necessary? So what my amendment does is it takes away the ability to indefinitely detain or place in military custody anybody captured or detained within the U.S. or its territories, within areas that the U.S. controls. Any person picked up in that situation will go through the normal due process Article III court process. Our constitutional due process process has worked. It has worked without having to give the president this enormous amount of power over individuals. So I am suggesting we don't need to give that power. Leaving it on the books is a dangerous threat to civil liberties. My amendment will strip that and take it away. Importantly, the other thing I want to point out, we had a huge discussion last year about making sure that this doesn't apply to U.S. citizens. Well, my amendment applies to everybody because the Constitution applies to everybody. The constitutional rights that are in the Constitution, nowhere in the Constitution or in the Bill of Rights will you see the words U.S. citizen. It says any person, any person deserves that same protection.